Hello, this is Pauline Jennings. Welcome to Musician Talk. My guest today, Peter Webb, has been playing piano since he was about six and has been performing regularly since then. Classically trained, he has become particularly enthusiastic about jazz in recent years and is a founding member of the group Sweet Jazz. As a teenager, he spent much time with the standard piano literature, but he also faced a career choice, mathematics or music, and mathematics won, and he is professor of mathematics at the University of Minnesota. Music is what he does, composing and playing, when not at work. Let's find out more about his journey from the UK to Minnesota, from classical to jazz, and so much more. Let's talk with Peter Webb. Hello, Peter. Welcome to Musician Talk. So great to have you here. Well, thank you very much, Pauline. It's an honor uh, to be here. I'm, I'm really pleased. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to discussing all the things that you propose to discuss. Oh, this, great, this is great. great. So. You know, usually I, I start off with asking about COVID and I feel like I can kind of start to transition out of that. But it was, it's been such a huge thing in all of our lives that it's interesting to find out how it has affected you as a musician. Um, and yeah. so if you have anything you want to say about that, have at it. Well, I don't know. The sad thing about COVID is that we didn't do as much of the performing arts as we might otherwise have done. Like I was supposed to be um, directing the pit for a production in Farbo of La Cage au Folle, for instance, which has got postponed twice now. It was, then supposed, it was supposed to be postponed to this summer, and now it's postponed to next summer, and I suppose it will come on, but we just haven't done those things. Right. And we haven't had theatre, I haven't been on stage or anything like that. I have um, a jazz group, you may know. Can I already plug that we are playing on June 10th, June the 19th, at the yes. Contenting Cow on the open air stage, I hope, because I hope it'll be um, nice weather. But we, we did actually get to perform during COVID. Looking back on it, I'm not sure how we managed to rehearse. I do believe we had masks on when we were doing it, but it all seems like a blur. And yeah. we gave a performance, I think, in July last summer and another one, second weekend of October. I remember that. We might have performed in September as well. But one of the things is it affects my practice on the on, on the piano and the sort of things that I've been playing, because um, now maybe I can tell you a, a secret, uh, which yes. is, I, I, I know, and there are all those people out there waiting to hear the secret. So what sort of secret could that be? But, oh, drum, no. yeah. um, but the, so if I have a gig coming up, if I've got a performance coming up, um, then I take it seriously and I practice. But if I haven't got a gig coming up, then I don't practice. I, I only really practice when I've got a gig coming up. And so I haven't had so many gigs coming up. And that has affected um, the kind of practice that I, I do. And what I've found over the COVID period of time is that I, when I play the piano, when I've been playing the piano, I've actually gone back to the um, many of the classical things mm. that I, I learned as a teenager and subsequently, uh, and things which I, I have neglected in some cases as the years have gone by. And I've gone back to those things and tried to remember them again. When I had them from memory, I've been putting them into memory again. And so I've been playing Chopin and Bach, and I learned a new Bach prelude and fugue. So but, but that's a way in which COVID has affected my, my playing. And so that's that's kind of a little bit of a silver lining. You have the drawbacks of not having the audience and being on stage, but that you went back to kind of your roots and revived yeah. that. It was actually quite nice. I've been yeah. enjoying playing with Chopin and stuff, and I'm, I'm keeping that up. Though we do have now gigs on the radar. And well, but you don't have Chopin gigs, so I'm... No. I'm so you are still playing that, even though you don't have a gig for it. That, that's, that's stuff I'm not going to let other people hear unless oh. I know them quite well. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> because I don't play it as, as well as I ought to. So I, I'm wondering about your musical journey. And you started playing piano when you were six. Did, is this something you wanted to do? Or was this something that your parents wanted you to do? Or both? It was actually something that I wanted to do. And I, my, my parents fixed up for me eventually to take 
lessons. It didn't take too long for that to happen, but I think it was in response to how I was because I was quite enthusiastic about the, the piano uh, from before the age of, of six. You might wonder, well, how would that manifest itself? Right. My father uh, used to play the piano and he really was my inspiration, actually. Uh, he was quite a good pianist. Um, and I, I remember seeing him play Debussy, for instance, and I used to love to watch him playing. We had an upright piano and you could open the top of the piano and I could see the hammers inside hitting the strings. And I, I used to love watching that activity and um, hearing him play like that. And I wanted to do the same thing myself. So the first thing was that my, my parents, and I think I must have been about five at the time, my parents got me um, a book which explained how to play the, the piano. It was actually Smallwood's Piano Forte Tutor. <laughs> it's one of these old fashioned things. I remember that. Um, I can remember it. I think I still have it somewhere. And wow. I tried to figure out like certain things. I was basically doing it by myself, but I wanted to do that. Um, and it didn't work very well. So uh, when, when we moved to London, which was when I was six, very soon after that, my parents fixed me up with um, one piano teacher who I didn't go to for very long. I think that that woman, like she could have been a little bit better. And soon after that, I, <laughs> I went to a man, I think I was probably now seven years old. His name was Douglas Zanders. And um, a charming man who, had come from New Zealand and he was my teacher right the way through my teenage years until I was 18 and oh. uh, like what I can do on the piano I mainly learned from him. When I was at school I did, um, this was in, in England, so you have O levels and A levels, now it's not O levels anymore, it's GCSEs but um, so I, I did those and I did O-level and A-level music. And in, in order to do that, I had to study quite a bit of theory. You have to learn and recognize um, musical cadences and stuff like that. And as part of my uh, training at school, when I was doing music A-level, I was like, harmonizing um, chorales in the style of Bach, which oh, wow. people probably do at university, you know. And so I, I was doing things like that at school. Um, and that gave me then my training. You're going to ask me something. I am, because I don't know how old is O-level and how old are you when you're in A-level? So uh, O-level people take when they're maybe 15, 16. You can okay. take them over a couple of years, or you did. It's now GCSEs, as I say. And the A-levels I took over two years when I was 17 and 18. So the A-levels are the final thing you take and that's the qualification that you get if you if you stay through high school if you if you leave earlier you don't you, you just finish with GS, GCSEs I suppose. And so um, you but, you went to your A-levels for music in anticipation of going to university for music? Now we come to the other big part of my life which is that I'm a mathematician and um, through those years I, I felt very comfortable with mathematics and also music and uh, it was apparent to me at, in those teenage years that when I was 16, 17, 18, that I could probably have a, a better career or, you know, do more somehow it, if I did mathematics rather than I did if I did music. And this is a recognition, which I, I think is the case, that it's really tough to make a career as a musician. Like yeah. To make money doing this thing that we'd love is really difficult. And it's actually easier to do that with mathematics. And I love mathematics. But when I was a teenager at school, the thing which meant the most to me of all these subjects was the music, and even more than the mathematics. I made the decision however, and it was my decision that I, when I went to university, I would do mathematics. And um, I, I then kept the music as something I would do uh, as an amateur. So I did yeah. not train professionally. Music is something that you can do at all levels. And you can do it as a wonderful professional, or you can do it as an amateur or whatever level you're at. Now, right. it, it's practically impossible 
to be a mathematician as an amateur. Right. You just can't do it. Uh, that totally makes yes. sense to me. Yeah. At this time also, uh, as, as well as the, the performing of music and the theory, I was very interested in, in composing. And as a teenager, I was um, sort of composing pieces and stuff like that. I didn't get, I didn't write that much, but I did have some things performed at the time. Um, and I was a member in London of the SPNM, which is the Society for Promotion of New Music. I don't know if that still exists. Uh, and I was very much into avant-garde things. You know, there was like Stockhausen and Boulez and various other people and minimalists and, uh, you know, Steve Reich and Terry Riley and so forth back then. And I, I was very much into these, these sort of things. And many of my friends were composers, which remains the case to this day. But then the next um, big stepping stone for me was... Um, sometime in the 2000s, probably about 2005, when I took serious steps to um, learn how to play jazz. And before that, I couldn't do it. What's the difference between learning jazz and classical? How, how, how is the approach different? Oh, yes. I'm not sure I've ever thought about that question before. <laughs> in a way, I'm not sure there are many differences about learning those two things. Okay. And let me try and elaborate on that to, a bit. Okay. Uh, so for a long time, before I started taking lessons from various people in, in jazz, uh, I've been into, I'd been listening to various recordings for a long time, like since the 1970s or jazz I heard on the radio, that kind of stuff. And I was really interested in jazz. And I'd tried to figure out how to do it, like how to do swing, for instance. I just couldn't figure it out. I couldn't. Then once somebody started teaching me, they said, well, you do this. You practice with the metronome on the offbeat, for instance, and various oh. other things like this, you know, some various things. And I started doing that and oh. it works. And Yay. I went to another person who taught me um, rootless voicings of the first of all, the voicings in the left hand, you know, you play chords with certain notes and these rootless voicings, I had somebody teach it to me, uh, which they did over a period of about four or five or six weeks. And oh. you can learn this stuff. And <laughs> this, this thing, which I thought was, I, I thought was, you, you just had to be born with it. I, right. I, I thought, you know, you're either that way or you're not. And there's, if you're not, there's no way you, you can do it this is not the case everything can be taught and so teaching mm -hmm. jazz in that way is similar to teaching classical and that all of this stuff um, can be taught there are different skills like I'll tell you what maybe the hardest skill for which I found classical uh, did not adequately prepare me that's the business of dealing with rhythm how to acquire the rhythmic skills that are required in in jazz the difference mm. to to what it is in much um classical w whether you're doing jazz or you're classical the answer is practice 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 right and right. it's the same thing either way got it so i i actually see a, a lot of similarities jazz is not a mysterious thing <laughs> um, it's something that that you can learn. Yeah, one well, one thing about it though, like when I came to jazz, and many for, probably for many people, it's like this. So some there are some people who start off, they just do jazz from the beginning, but a huge number of people are classically trained first of all, and then you do jazz. And when I came to jazz, I could already find my way around the instrument. It's more stylistic things and the, the business of how to deal with the rhythm and, and so forth that I could already find my way around the piano. You know, you can um, you could find your way around the piano with arpeggios and, and, and scales and all that, which you have to know all that deep down in your soul in order to improvise. And so there's that that part of jazz, too, that, you, you know, you learned about different voicings of chords and about the rhythm and all that stuff. But then there's that then there's this next step of improvising. And did you find that a challenge? Yes, and it still is a challenge. Yeah. And that is, um, that, that to do a good improvisation, an improvisation that I myself feel good about afterwards is a, a really tricky thing to do. My, my tremendous teacher, one of my teachers in jazz who lives in the community, Laura Caviani, so I should talk Oh, she's wonderful. Her. She is yeah. absolutely wonderful. Yeah. And 
now, you know, she lives just a few blocks away and is a friend and everything like that. But I remember her saying, I'm not sure I can remember the thing she said. If you want to, if you're playing a tune and you want to improvise, then um, there are three basic things that you can do. One is you can take um, the tune and change the notes, but maybe do the same rhythm. And then um, you could, a second thing, you could take the tune and you could take those notes, but you could change the rhythm do them in a different rhythm. Hmm. And then the other thing, I'm not completely sure what she said, if she's listening, <laughs> they don't know what she's saying now, but I think it had to do with filling in the bits in between. So you could take whatever it is and then fill in something in between what you do. Yeah. And that's probably more advanced. The improvising, um, it not only is with your, it has to do with your chops and how good your chops are, and it, but it also has to do with the brain and t turning off the judge in your brain, which I don't think you have to do that as much for any other kind of music other than um, improvising, improvising, you know, in anything. But yet that judge has got to be turned off. Otherwise, it's really yeah. hard to, 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 to do a good solo. And I have yet to figure out how to do that vocally. So I don't improvise much it's, at all. I, this business about what you were saying about turning the mind off and, and yeah. so forth. It strikes a chord with me, uh, and actually something to do with the difference between jazz and classical music. And it's one of the reasons, classical performance, I should say, and it's one of the reasons why I like jazz. And it has to do with how you may judge um, whether somebody has done a good performance. And it has to do with the turning off of the mind, because there is a certain um, area of classical music. I'm thinking of the sort of situation where somebody's a concert pianist and giving a solo recital and the, the audience is, goes to a hush and this person comes on stage, you know, all looking very dapper and they sit down at the keyboard, round of applause and everything. And then they play a Beethoven piano sonata or whatever it is. And it's got to be perfect. Um, like if they play a wrong note, that is a significant thing. And I, I'm not comfortable with that, I must say. It, it's kind of a negative way of judging things, hmm. um, to my point of view. Well, anything that is falling short of perfection is something which takes away from how people will judge you. Sure. Whereas you can do things in a different way. Like what, what I like is if a performer does something which is positive, then I like it that they should be recognized for that positive thing um, that they do. And I feel jazz does this in a way which I'll get to in just a moment. But when, when I was a kid and I was doing these classical performances and my teacher had like student cycles and things, I was terrified and I'd get up in front of these other things, you know, I'm playing wrong notes and things. I hated it. And yeah. I would much sooner people judge me for what I could contribute rather than what I failed to do in mm. the goal of perfection. And I feel jazz is, a, a, and other art forms, as other musical forms as well. And it's exemplified by somebody does a solo. And you may do something which is very simple, and that could be very effective. Or you could do something which achieves a bit more. And it, it may be that you play some notes that you don't intend to play, <laughs> but for various reasons, it might not matter. And it might actually make it more interesting. And mm -hmm. the way we judge somebody's solo is not by the perfection that they failed to achieve, but by how much they managed to contribute. I love that, that idea of judging you on what you contribute as opposed to how you weren't perfect, perfect or how yeah. far you were from perfect. Now, I want to, I'm going to switch things up a little bit here because I want to get to the first song so we don't have them uh, piled up at the end of, end of the show. <laughs> so we're going to come back to your journey between the two songs. So I want to turn to the first song that you picked out, which is called Bits and Pieces. And this, you were talked about being a composer, and this is one of the songs that you wrote. Tell me a little bit about this, writing it yeah. and where it came from. I, I wrote it after a time uh, when I was staying in Berkeley, California for about five months. This was in 2008. Eight. And it was wonderful. And I was absorbing all these things. And they have a school there, actually, which is um, at the time it was called the Jazz School. And I, I remember walking down the street one day in Berkeley and going past this place and Jazz School, you know, I had to go in. And before I left, I had I, I had actually registered to take a class there it was the right time of year you oh. could 
do that. And then I went to various concerts and I was influenced by what happened there. There was one particular pianist who came by, who I think lives in New York, who works in New York. His name is Jarrett Turner, And he um, performed with his trio um, one evening. And I thought it was tremendous. I loved many things about it. I loved what he was doing rhythmically, um, the sort of fresh take on things, also the sort of harmonies that he was using. And I use, I would say, not conventional, not so much conventional harmonies. I, I like um, sounds that on the one hand are may, maybe weird in a certain way or unusual, but at the same time fit so that you feel that they are natural. I'm not trying to shock people out of their skins by what I write. Um, in fact, I, I want to write things that people will immediately like. One thing about it also is that it, it's not entirely straightforward. Like it's, it, it starts off straight and it goes into swing and it finishes up straight. It does all this. Yes. Um, so if you like, I, I was trying to fool around and to, to sort of exercise in composition, uh, incorporating those different things. And you did, um, and you did. So let's take a listen to uh, bits and pieces written by my guest, Peter Webb. Here it is. And he's on piano too.
This is Pauline Jennings, and you're listening to Musician Talk, hosted by me. You just heard bits and pieces written by my guest, Peter Webb, and featuring him on the piano. So um, I love this piece. I love the different sections. I really do. There's parts that are um, exciting and parts that are lyrical. And I love the, uh, the interplay between that. And, and you're right, there's unconventional, unusual harmonies and going on there, but it's not discordant. So let's get back to your journey. We left you, you were in England. Uh, take us from there then coming to the United yes. States. And I came to the United States at the end of the 1980s. In 88 is really the time when I would um, consider that I, I did that. And one difference between the United States and England musically is that jazz is prevalent. And so come back to this this thing, you know, I'd been listening to jazz recordings and so forth, been fascinated by it um, in, in England. And uh, if I could have gone to somebody who would have taught me uh, how to sort these things out in terms of jazz, I would have done so. I knew of nobody where I was living. And actually, when I came to Minnesota, uh, like you have to seek out somebody who will teach you jazz. Not everybody can do it and, and that sort of thing. Anyway, I'm, I moved to Minnesota in um, 1989. Fast forward to really 2004, 2005, um, which is when I started acting. It, it was a, a production of Dracula directed by um, Mark Robinson who was so foolish as to offer this person who <laughs> never had a part on stage before a part in his play. I just couldn't believe it. Wow. But anyway, in that, in that show, um, I met Christina Schweitz, uh, who uh, sings wonderfully. Yes. Uh, she is a singer. And we decided to explore doing jazz songs together and to figure out how this could be done. We didn't really know. So we were trying to find somebody who could teach us. Uh, and what we did was we, we knew Dave Hagedorn, who um, was in, in charge of the band program at St. Olaf. And I think he's recently stopped doing that. But um, we knew him and we, we went along to consult with him. And here were these two people who were you know, like basically incompetent in terms of his discipline of, of jazz like that. And we asked him, you know, what do we do? And he was very kind. Uh, he, he, he took us seriously. He gave us the time of day, which more than the time of day, which he need not have done. And he gave us um, some advice, which was absolutely valuable. From that, we then, we joined up with David Miller, who um, is an extraordinary musician. So that actually, I think there's something like three David Millers. There are, that you're talking about the drummer, David Miller. Talking about the drummer, and he, sometime after meeting him, I discovered that his first instrument was keyboard and he plays piano, he's a pianist. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, but he does all these other things. Anyway, he's our drummer, and we decided we need a bass at some point, and we formed, the group Sweet Jazz. The bass player is? The piece which you're going to play, which is the Crangle Wangle's Hat, uh, has Muriel Carpenter. Got it. Um, on, uh, playing bass, who many people will know probably because she went through high school um, here. And yeah. before I forget it, I want to mention who are the musicians in bits and pieces that we heard. So you're on piano, which I had said, and then Dave Miller's on drums and Muriel is on bass on the bits and pieces or not on that? Muriel is, Muriel is on bass on bits and pieces. Okay, also. good. Okay. All right. Yes. yes. But we, we have had several bass players in the group. One of, the, one of the things is if you have a young person who's growing up, they go through high school and so forth, they move, they leave <laughs> at some point. Um, and so your bass player now is? Rob Thompson Rob is Thompson. currently yeah, um, right. playing with us. And he'll um, be playing at the gig at the Cow on the 19th at 5 o'clock. Right. Okay. Absolutely, yeah. It's a beautiful yes. spot to sit and have it's a, a drink. And, yeah. it's a, it, I can't believe it. We've got the river going by behind us. You're yeah. up there on stage, you look out, there are people coming by on the on the sidewalks and things, and there's the river down there, and it's absolutely gorgeous. It is. And I, it is. I love it. Let's move on to this next song. And of course, I am very intrigued by the name. It's called Quangle Wangle's Hat. And this is another original uh, written by you. 
And the performance we're going to hear is the Sweet Jazz uh, group uh, that we'll hear in a second here. But why don't you tell us about that name? It's the Quangle Wangle. Oh, thank you. Hat. And this is one of the um, poems, I can speak for quite a long time on this, by the way. There is one of the poems by Edward Lear, who um, you may know in the 19th century, was a great art, fine artist, and his work is in a, a number of museums um, around the world. And also he is known for um, writing nonsense poems and stories. Uh, and he, he wrote these over, a period of decades, like from something like about nine, about 1840 through to, oh. I've got the book here, 1846 was his first one through to 1895. Wow. Uh, they're, they're about crazy animals and things like this, and they may seem silly and children can respond to, the, to these poems. But I, I didn't set the Quangle Wangle's hat just because it's a, a kid's poem. It actually operates on a number of different um, levels. So can, let me tell you roughly the story. In the first verse, the Quangle Wangle is introduced. What we do learn is that the Quangle Wangle has a magnificent hat, the most extraordinary mm. hat. And then as the story progresses, uh, two birds come and they ask if they can build a nest in his hat. Mm. The Quangle Wangle says yes. And then more creatures come and they are the most wonderful creatures. My favorite, the blue baboon who played the flute. These <laughs> oh, that's a great and image. They all come and they ask if they can live on the, the Quangle Wangle's hat. And then the final verse is they enjoy themselves and they have a party. But there's many more serious things behind what is going on because it's a metaphor for things which are really important in our, our lives. So it's about, if you will, immigration. Yeah. You have the, the Quangle Wangle, who is just living there. And these exotic creatures come from somewhere else. Um, they don't know each other. And the, the Quangle Wangle doesn't know them. And they clearly come from a distance. And they all meet and they get on. And the Quangle mm. Wangle is pleased about this. Mm and they live in peace. Mm. And that is a, a model for the world. And I'm quite pleased with the setting that I'm, mm. I'm made of it um, too. You know, I, for me, I, I enjoy to play this, uh, this piece when we get to play it. Well, I enjoyed listening to it and I so appreciate you setting this up and telling us about that poem because it just adds so much depth. And this is the point of us talking about this so that the audience can have some insight into what's going on inside of a songwriter's head. So with all that said, let's listen to the Quangle Wangle's hat. Thank you. 
You are listening to Musician Talk, hosted by me, Pauline Jennings, with my guest, Peter Webb. You just heard Sweet Jazz, a group Peter co-founded, playing his original song, The Quangle Wangle's Hat. It's a great, fun song, and it's, it's whimsical in lyric and in, and in feel to me. And uh, your, your piano playing is very, very smooth. Love it. Well, thank you. Love it. Thank Love you. it. Yeah. Um, so let's keep moving here. I'm wondering about culturally um, the importance of music or how music matters. If there is a difference between the U- United States and the UK, that's kind of a big, broad question, but whatever you can grab onto in that, within that question, if there are any differences. The amazing thing about music is that uh, in all places, uh, everywhere I know of around the world, and at all times in history, and among all age groups, people seem to want to do music. Yeah. And this is one of the great mysteries of the world, of who we are as a human species. Um, like I am of that philosophy, and that it is this, un- obviously, it is this universal language in a very profound and mysterious sense. And in that sense, it, it's the same as the same in in Britain as it is in the United States or anywhere. And this is where we'll end it. I do want to ha- ask you, first of all, I want to mention again that uh, Sweet Jazz is playing at the Cow on June 19th at five o'clock. Uh, uh, hopefully, if the weather uh, cooperates, it's going to be outside on the open air stage, which is a beautiful place to see somebody. And I have heard these guys. They're wonderful. Christina, she really can sing. If people want to hire Sweet Jazz, where is there an email address I can give? My address is W-E-B-B, as my name, at U-M-N dot E-D-U. I'm a Bye. professor at the University of Minnesota. I just want to say thank you so much, Peter, for joining me. And what a delightful conversation. I really look forward to see you guys down at the Cal this weekend. Well, thank you. Pauline, I've been very pleased to be here. Thank you so much for asking me. It, it's been fun just talking about these these things and I really appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. Many, many thanks to Peter for joining me for this lively conversation this morning and heartfelt gratitude to you for listening to Musician Talk on The One, KYMN. Tune in next week and have a terrific day. Music